Let's look at a very distinctive medieval falchion from the Royal Armoury's windlass collection known as IX-144. Hi folks, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria and I've been working with the Royal Armouries and Windlass for the last couple of years, working on the first batch of six swords to be released um, certified replicas from the Royal Armouries of swords in the Royal Armouries. I studied them, I measured them, I took all of the photographs and very detailed measurements and we went through various stages of prototype to finally get to replica swords which are as close as, with handmade objects, um, as close as you can really get to true replicas of what you will find in the Royal Armouries. Now I selected those swords based on a number of criteria where I wanted some one-handed, some two-handed, and I wanted a variety of different types, but we were focusing this time on medieval swords. And I couldn't ignore one of the most beautiful examples of a very important group of medieval swords that are sometimes known as the Wakefield Hangers. Now the Wakefield Hangers represent a group of one-handed swords used by, for the most part, common medieval soldiers, people like archers and billmen and crossbowmen. And they're very, very important sidearms because they combine a number of features, usually the beginnings of complex guards, and indeed certain types of predominantly single-edged blades, are relatively short, shorter than a typical knightly arming sword, for example, that are really specialised weapons or sidearms for this type of soldier. So, all of these, as mentioned, are certified Royal Armouries um, replicas. They've been uh, signed off and approved by both me and Henry Yallop at the Royal Armouries, and you get a certificate of authenticity in each of these. These are hand forged, traditionally hand forged and finished, and uh, they are. Uh, available from the Royal Armouries or from numerous other sellers around the world. So let's have a look at the Wakefield Hanger, as it's sometimes known. In fact, it's not the sword that some, pe some people would refer to as the Wakefield Hanger. It is IX-144, as the Royal Armouries catalogue it, but it's a very famous example, and here it is. So as you can see, it's not a super short sword, but it is shorter than a typical arming sword. And one of the first things you'll notice about it is it has a very distinctive style of knuckle bow, and we could call it a reverse S guard. It looks a bit like a, num uh, like a letter S. So that knuckle bow is a very, well, relatively early example of a knuckle bow hand defense on a medieval sword. Now, it's clear to most people who've studied medieval warfare and arms and armor that this is a particular adaptation for people who are not wearing gauntlets. In fact, you cannot fit gauntlets into these hilts. These are specifically made for a bare hand or at most a hand in gloves. Therefore, this type of hilt is perfectly suited to a type of soldier who either can't afford gauntlets, for example, a common billman, or a type of soldier who cannot wear gauntlets, like a longbowman, uh, because you can't wear gauntlets and shoot a longbow. So therefore, for the people who have vulnerable hands, in a world where hands are very vulnerable things, having extra hand protection is a very, very good thing. And this curve of this knuckle bow is balanced by the reverse curve of the guard at the back. Now, we're talking about English types of swords here, but I should point out these types of swords are found also in continental Europe, particularly probably in France and Flanders, Belgium, perhaps Burgundy as well. Not to say that you don't find equivalent types of sword in Italy and Germany and Spain, you do. However, they have slightly different hilt forms. This particular family of swords with that very distinctive, uh, almost um, beaked style pommel. It's almost like an animal head, isn't it, going forwards? And in fact, there are some examples, later examples, where that is made into an animal head type. But this is a, probably a fairly early one. This dates to around 1460 to 1480 or 90, probably. Um, and that's an estimation based on the current information we have available. There are later forms of this, there are Tudor forms of this, um, but there probably aren't really earlier forms than this. This is one of the earliest types. Some later forms, incidentally, have a bar on the outside. Now, this, as you will see, has a side lug. Now, that side lug does provide additional protection to the outside of the hand. And for anyone who knows about the German Langmesser, you will know about the Nagel, or nail, which sticks out the side. This is the equivalent of that, okay? So this is like the Nagel on a German sword. Some later examples, they turn that into a shell guard, some have a bar guard. In fact, there is another example in the Royal Armouries, which does have a full bar, but we believe that to be a later 
uh, example of this family of swords. We had some debate actually over whether to, because on the original sword, so um, IX144 in the Royal Armouries, the end of that lug is actually broken. So we don't really know how long the original lug was. And initially we were thinking about turning it into a full bar. And in fact, we did make a prototype with a full bar on it, which you may have seen in some of my videos. Uh, but we decided on further thought and looking at other examples, that actually probably this specific example, 144, probably didn't have a full sidebar, it probably just had a lug, but the end of the lug has been broken off archaeologically. I should mention as well, in fact, that this specific sword, 144, in the Royal Armouries, we don't actually know where it came from, but we do know that it was already in the Royal Armouries in uh, the Tower of London by 1916, because it's recorded in 1916, but we don't know where it came from. Probably, looking at the condition of it, it was dug out of a field somewhere, probably in the Midlands or Northern England. It probably dates to the Wars of the Roses and was probably the sidearm of something like an archer or a billman during the Wars of the Roses, and was abandoned or lost during um, the conflict of that famous um, warring period. So anyway, we decided to go with the side lug on this particular example. Now, the hilt is very interesting for a number of reasons I've mentioned. I mentioned the side lug, I've mentioned the knuckle bow, and I've mentioned the pommel. In fact, the length of the hilt is not very long. Uh, if I just uh, put my hand in here, I'm going to talk about the blade in a second, so I'm keeping it in its scabbard, because the blade, for me, is really the high point of this sword and was the most difficult thing to get right. The grip is actually quite short, so it really fits the hand snugly. You cannot fit gauntlets into this, okay? So this hilt was never meant to be used with gauntlets. It was meant to be used with bare hands in my opinion. You can just about put your thumb up the back, which we sometimes call the sabre grip, and that is sometimes seen uh, used with the Langmesser and the Dussac in treatises of the 15th and 16th centuries. So you can hold this with the thumb up grip um, by pushing your hand all the way down to the pommel and sticking your thumb up the back of the grip like that. Um, however, it's quite possible that because of the shape of that pommel, it wasn't necessarily intended to be held like that. I don't know, but I can comfortably hold it thumb up or in a hammer fist or handshake grip. Now let's talk about the blade. So as mentioned, these Wakefield hangers, and in fact all types of Langmesser and um, sidearm hanger that were around in England and Northern Europe at this time, have a variety of blades, but most of them are predominantly single-edged, and this is also. So let's have a look at this beautiful blade. The scabbard, incidentally, as with the others in this range, is made of uh, wood with a leather covering, nicely hand-stitched, and with a simple, matching the sword in this case, a simple bronze shape at the end, and uh, rain flaps up at the top as well. Um, now, this blade was not easy to get right, I will tell you. So first of all, it is a complex blade. Despite the fact that this might be seen as a working class or middle class, low class sword, do not think that that means that this is a simple sword. It is not. In f some funny way, this is probably the most complex blade in the entire first batch of Royal Armouries windless swords that we worked on. It's got a really complex blade geometry. So first of all, it has a narrow filler, you can probably see that clearly, that goes about two thirds of the way up the blade. And then it has what some people might refer to as a full sedge. However, it's more complex than that because this entire front edge all the way up here and from there to there is fully edged on the original and on this example as well. This is hollow ground, okay? What does hollow grinding mean? Quite simply, it means that once you've made your wedge section blade, you grind out some of the material from that so it, you hollow those faces. What does this do? First of all, it reduces mass while retaining stiffness, um, but it makes the blade much lighter and it has the consequence of making the edges that much finer. It gives you a very acute edge. With the result that this is a very thin and fine edge, and this is really quite a light sword. Um, it's under a kilogram and this matches the original. Um, and so edged, this will be very, very sharp, uh, very good cutter and very nimble. And I should mention, this is a really light and quick sword. It's super quick. It's super, super well adapted to fighting in, um, uh, you know, fighting lightly equipped, 
for example, archers fighting other archers or billmen or whatever. This is a perfect sidearm. And equally in civilian life, you know, for traveling and this kind of thing, as a sidearm in civilian life, this is brilliant because it's got pretty good reach, is very light, very easy to carry, very easy to wear, won't get in the way, uh, but also has brilliant cutting potential and brilliant thrusting potential. Now that full sedge achieves a couple of things. First of all, you could edge it. I'm not convinced that the original was actually sharpened on the full sedge, although that's open to debate. But what having that full sedge does do is it gives a really, really acute point. And the point on this and on the original is wicked. I mean, as a thrusting, as a thrusting weapon, as a thrusting implement, this is incredibly good cut and thrust sword. So you've really gained a lot of the things that you actually find with later hangers and sabers um, and, in, you know, in fairness, quite a lot of medieval falchions, you've combined very good cutting potential with, against lightly equipped targets, very good thrusting potential. Now, I'm not going to lie, this is not the best sword for fighting against people in armour, okay? So jamming this into, into mail or chain mail, it doesn't have the right shape tip really to deal with mail very well. It's a bit too thin, a bit too fragile. This has very good distal taper, I should mention, by the way. Um, really quite thick at the base. I think it's about six, six or seven millimeters at the base and basically linear distal taper all the way down. So it's really quite thin at the tip here. Um, so this isn't really geared up for fighting against people in heavy armor. This is for people like archers and billmen to fight against other soldiers like archers and billmen, or indeed for civilians to fight other civilians. Incidentally, often used with a buckler. Okay, so this type of sword would often be used with a buckler in the spare hand. They can easily be worn at the side, so you can use your crossbow or longbow, or whatever you're using, and then when you need to, you can pull the sword and buckler out, and you're now very equipped to defend yourself and to take on similarly equipped people. But fighting in armor, no, that's not what this sword is for. As we've seen, the hilt cannot accommodate a gauntlet, and the point is not really adapted for fighting in armor, but it's fantastically adapted for, for fighting people who are either not in armor or who have lots of exposed arms and legs and faces. So there we have it, what I consider to be an absolutely iconic sword sword of the 15th century from the second half of the 15th century. Very um, important English grouping of swords and this for me to my eyes is the most beautiful example that survives from that grouping. There's about there's about 10 or 15 swords I believe um, catalogued in that grouping um, by James Elmsley and this is to my eyes the most beautiful of those and one of the earlier ones as well I think. Um, so fantastic cut and trust sword and this as, as mentioned this is you know, windless, windless swords are hand forged in the traditional manner. This is carbon steel, 1080, hardened to about 52 to 54 Rockwell at the edge. Um, so it's a fully functional, effective replica, very, very close to the original. And this has been through three prototype stages and took really quite a lot to get this close to the original. It's a complex sword don't underestimate it. And it is an absolute joy in the hand. It just wants to move. A really, really fun sword. Anyway, check out the links below. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. A beautiful sword. And if you get one of these, I don't think you will ever regret it. Um, and I'm absolutely chuffed to have one of these for my own after admiring this in the Royal Armouries for so many years. Thanks a lot for watching. I'm Matt Easton and I will see you again soon. Cheers, folks.